Gospels last Friday. Praise God. Like, you know, I'm going to keep us all. Amen. I'm on a chord. Praise the Lord. Amen. But the whole idea, I think, has um, really been born out of this appreciation, right? That in many of our communities across the country, uh, whether we are black, brown, poor, immigrant, citizens, whatever, there is a level of police violence that is escalating. Yes. And we are called, I believe, um, uh, as someone myself who's been physically and sexually assaulted by the police uh, in my ministry uh, career, um, that you know, just being a member of the church or follower of Jesus does not necessarily shield one or our families from this brutality, amen? Yeah. Amen, how many of you know someone, amen, who, who has had a very disturbing encounter with any kind of law enforcement whatsoever in the schools, in the neighborhoods, anybody, anybody know a few folks like that, right? So part of what we're trying to do is be a part of the solution, right? But also continue to appreciate uh, that there is an important role for the church as an institution to play. Uh, you know, um, you that are members of the church, uh, can you pull those doors shut because the glare is just wiping me out here in the middle. Uh, it's the sun and the water and the cars. It's just killing me. Hey, whoo. <laughs> Thank God. I don't need to be led by somebody after a minute. Um, but you can appreciate that on uh, uh, the, the first week after my ground was killed, we were called there. And, and uh, many of you know, for the last several months, We've been going back and forth and back and forth. And last week, uh, I got called uh, on the Friday, uh, well, on the Thursday, it was told that they, uh, the grand jury was wrapping up their testimony on Friday. Now, you've got to appreciate that while I've been back there, a number of us uh, that make up a coalition, umbrella group called the Don't You Coalition, have been meeting with Captain Ron Johnson, who's the African American police captain. Many of you may uh, uh, recognize his face uh, in, the, in the communities and uh, in Ferguson. We met with uh, Police Chief uh, Dotson, the Police Chief of St. Louis Police Department, and Police Chief Belmar, uh, the St. Louis County Police Department. We were meeting with them in this coalition, as a coalition, leading up to the grand jury decision. And we were getting uh, very much uh, clear on what we were calling 19 rules of engagement or agreements that we were asking for them to uh, agree to so we can all as a community be in position to respond when the grand jury decision came down, whether it was an a, a indictment or a no indictment. And just so you know, leading up to the grand jury decision, we asked for 48 hours notice so we all could be prepared and, and move our community and our clergy and folks in position. We asked for uh, uh, the, the, the thing to be read uh, hopefully in the morning uh, or at least in the late evening after so kids can get home. We uh, asked for uh, there to be safe houses uh, that the churches and other community uh, buildings could be used for just in case protests happen uh, that turn violent, that all the nonviolent protesters would be able to be positioned out of harm's way. We asked for a number of these things and they agreed to 10 of the 19, which included giving folks notice and included doing safe houses, et cetera, et cetera. And as I was preparing to come back home on that Monday, because obviously the verdict didn't happen on Friday, as we were told. We were told it may happen on a Sunday during church, and they did not do it on a Sunday. They reconvened the jury on Monday, and uh, I was on my way, uh, getting ready to book my ticket to come back home on Monday, and I got a call around 2.33 o'clock. And we were told that the grand jury and the district attorney were getting ready to announce their verdict at 5 o'clock. We had asked for 48 hours and they gave us less than two hours notice. Uh, people were scrambling all over the region trying to get home from work, trying to get off the freeways. All of our clergy and young people were doing press and media. So none of us were in a position to do much of anything. Um, and it was very, very difficult a reality for us uh, because we were told it was going to happen at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and they did not read the uh, decision until almost 8.30 at night. And they had people standing outside, and it was cold, y'all. 
And when I tell you, I'm not talking about California code. I'm talking about the Midwest kind of code. And it don't matter what you got on, you might be standing out there with nothing on, because it just shoot anybody been in that kind of Midwest code, praise God, where it, it makes you cry. It's so cold. It makes you think hell is cold and not hot. It's so miserable. Somebody say amen, right? It was that cold. And folks were standing outside in the cold for two or three hours waiting for the decision. And I don't know how many of you heard the decision, but the way the decision was announced was uh, so, I believe, inflammatory. And it was demonizing of Mike Brown and the whole community once again. The family heard the decision at the exact same time that everyone else did, even though they agreed to give the family at least 24 hours notice of the decision so they can process it through it uh, before hearing everyone else. And clearly none of that was agreed to or honored. And uh, it was very painful to be there in the community and watch um, young people walking around with gas masks a whole uh, weekend, uh, watching folks falling on the ground crying about the decision, watching uh, law enforcement folks and other folks following young people around in Humvees and unmarked cars and pulling people out at gunpoint uh, for no reason, arresting folk, uh, not telling people where they were going and releasing them without any kind of charges. Very, very difficult to absorb and to appreciate um, the level of trauma the community has experienced. And I do believe being there on the ground, um, that it is a moment for the church, people of faith, followers of God, to not uh, just fall into some of the tired, uh, regurgitated, uh, racialized, and dehumanized tropes that our media is putting out there. But I'm hoping we all can begin to imagine together what does God require of us in this moment? It is unique to us as followers of Jesus. And what do uh, we do? Uh, how does our church continue to respond? And how does the larger body of Christ particularly respond in a time when uh, I believe our country is being consumed by flames of racial animus, uh, racial division, and uh, a lot of violence? Violence in our own communities, violence from outside of our communities, violence perpetuated in the world. Uh, I believe that we who serve the one who uh, came to set the captive free cannot participate in keeping others in captivity. Amen? Amen. So I solicit your prayers. Um, we, we want to continue to be faithful, but we also want to be seeking the face of God so our engagement can indeed be faithful. And uh, I thank God that you all have been uh, so gracious and generous. I know that my calling here as your pastor uh, has uh, uh, been, uh, you know, very difficult uh, for a lot of us because I've been gone and traveling. Uh, but I want to appreciate Pastor Donna, I want to appreciate Pastor Teddy and Pastor Phil and all of those who stand in the gap in my absence. And uh, I just certainly hope and pray that you all know that our work in ministry is, is, is impacting many, many people all across the world, not just the country, folks in Palestine and South Africa and all other places that are dealing with their own issues of oppression are reaching out to us and they're learning from our faith-filled engagement and uh, not being turned over to nihilism and hopelessness. And I think uh, the city that is set on the hill, uh, when the light shines, how many know that you don't get to control where the light shines? Amen, but it will uh, shine wherever God has to go. Is that all right? Amen. So I think God Let's dismiss our children, ages 11 and below. Uh, ages 11 and below, they're going to be dismissed to the rear so they can hear the word of God in a way they can understand. So put your hands together, everybody. As, uh, amen. Amen. The Motley crew, amen. Of all the pastoral staff's uh, kids, amen. Uh, they roll tough with each other, amen. Uh, we're going to be launching a series for this whole month. Um, it is the season of Advent, so we're going to be launching a series for the Advent season that allows us, I believe, to uh, imagine what a faith-filled response in this moment may look like. And uh, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31 uh, is where we will uh, begin our time together. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, I will uh, try to give you and I a little bit of a, of a background on uh, the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet, uh, one of the major prophets in uh, the Old Testament. Jeremiah's uh, role as a prophet, and there I say the role of any prophet, 
is not to uh, be your personal fortune teller. Right. To read the tea leaves and tell you who your boo is going to be. Mm -hmm. to, not to tell you how much money is coming your way. How many houses you going to own, cars you going to drive, private jets you going to be able to fly on. How many of you know that's not a biblical prophet? Amen. But a biblical prophet is the kind of prophet, uh, the book of Jeremiah said, that if you were my prophet, you would have caused my people to stop from their sins. In, 
in, in the Israel nation, ancient Israel, where the Benjamites lived. If you're another Bible student, you'll appreciate that the Benjamites uh, were descendants of Benjamin, one of the brothers of Joseph, one of the most treasured and loved sons of Rachel. Rachel could only have a couple sons, Rachel and, I'm sorry, Benjamin and Joseph. And the Benjamites lived here in Ramah and denotes this intimacy and this deep concern and connection uh, towards Rachel. A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. <laughs> Verse number 16, thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for there is a reward for your work says the Lord. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back to their own country. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right. Uh, we're going to take a few moments to open up this Advent series uh, from this passage. Uh, the title of today's sermon will simply be Tis the Season. Yeah. Tis the season. Father, in the name of the Lord, bless the word of God for the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor this is the season. Tell them that this is the season. Now, understand my brothers and sisters that on Thanksgiving. Usually the fourth Sunday preceding Christmas Day. The liturgical calendar for the Western Church in particular starts over. It begins anew. The worship calendar, the liturgical calendar, it starts over at the beginning and it is called Advent. It is this appreciation, this awareness, this idea that the coming of Jesus is really the beginning of the life of the church. That it is not the secularized, celebrated Christmas Day that we build our spiritual and discipleship process around, but it is indeed a month of preparation time. Yeah. Because how many of you know, if you keep it real, some of us need to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Amen. It is this awareness and appreciation that you and I, although we are living in the time calendar of the world, particularly here in the West, January to December, that we have another time that we are living according to. And this timing is God's time. How many of you know there's a difference between the world's time and God's time? Anybody can appreciate that the world has a calendar that they can forecast and they can plan around, but there's a timing that God has that can't nobody control. Engaging in a head start for the new year. A new time for you and I to engage in a lifestyle that pleases God. Advent marks the beginning of this worship year for the follower of Jesus. And how many of you know that worship rightly understood is not limited to a gathering on the weekend? Worship rightly understood is more than the 20, 30 minutes that Pastor Phil and Grace 
the worship team and the musicians lead us in every Sunday morning? That worship, listen, is a lifestyle. That your whole life, your posture, is all about how are you orienting your way to God's way. And the centerpiece of our lives being built around God. Worship affords you and I the opportunity in this contemporary moment to be awakened and reawakened and imagine and reimagine the ways in which God is calling us to live faithfully in this moment. Now understand my brothers and sisters that this season is not living in isolation from the rest of the seasons. Right. Because how many of you know there are a lot of other seasons that are competing for your attention? Right. I wish I had an honest church in here this morning. Right. Matter of fact, I wish I had a 9 a.m. service that would say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them there's a competition going on. Amen. That, that, there's a competition going on for your participation in the season. Yes. And in these seasons, you'll find that there are a whole lot of powerful storytellers in the media, uh, in the pulpits, in the neighborhoods, all over.
But these structures must be paid attention to. They must not be ignored. Dr. King, he says it like this, particularly as it relates to all of us who are aware of the violence that is being perpetuated in our communities, upon our communities, and even in the world. Dr. King starts to nudge at these structures and he says, we must not be concerned merely about who murders, but about the system and the way of life, the philosophy which produces the murder. There are structures at work among us. Structures we participate in that we feel individually that is manifested through our interpersonal reactions. But understand, brothers and sisters, these structures should never be confused with people. Paul said it like this. For we wrestle not against flesh and but against principalities, against powers, evil, wickedness in high places. Paul is saying, your enemy is not the person you see. Your enemy are these structures and these systems. And some of us get so caught up in the people we see. If I can see you, you are not my enemy. Even though you may be on the enemy's team. Somebody say amen. Ask them, which team you playing on today? Amen. Turn around and look at your jersey. Praise God. <laughs> there are structures that you and I are starting to see becoming exposed across the country. And if there's one takeaway from the moment we're living in right now, is that people are pushing back real hard on these structures. They're saying, oh, no, 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 no. You can't do this to our community. You can't engage in these kinds of evil acts. And we just, uh, as followers of Jesus, are going to go along with it. And uh, no, God calls us to be part of liberation, not just of the spirit and the soul, but of the body as well. Because what good is it to save your soul and your body be lost? Amen. Hey, this is when we lift the ball of Jesus and before Jesus preached the folk, he always did what? Sat him down and he fed him. But Jesus could have just told him, you know, I'm just here to preach and I hope you listen. He that have an ear, <laughs> let him hear. Jesus fed folk. Jesus healed folk. Jesus raised folk from the dead. He was concerned about their whole person. Right. Not just to stay in their spirit, yeah. but then Jesus also told them, don't get so consumed with your human material side. Yeah. Don't get too consumed with the wealth and the riches, because that stuff ain't going with you to heaven. Yeah. Don't get so consumed with the bread, because you can't live by that alone either. Yeah. Don't get so consumed with, with the food, because I can give you food and water, and then we just hear a sermon about being a few weeks ago that I can give you something that will cause you to never thirst again. But guess what? Where that happened at? It still happened by the way. So Jesus in this moment, this Advent moment, I believe is giving you and I an opportunity to engage and lean in. Now keep it real, uh, people of God, I know that when you look at some of this stuff, it just seems too radical. How many of y'all feel like something is too radical? I'm saying, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm with Jesus. It's just Jesus, me, and him. And I'm not trying to be out there overturning no governments. <laughs> Any real folk in here today? I mean, I'm just trying to make it to heaven, Pastor. That's what I was told. We're going to go to heaven. If I can just get to heaven. Well, how many of you know on your way to heaven? We got to occupy until he comes. And occupy means take care of. Be a steward of. Your life should not be a living hell on your way to heaven. That's right. Your family's life should not be a living hell on your way to heaven. And for many of us, we don't have the language or the framework to fully understand the season that we are living in or what the role for the follower of Jesus is in this space and in this time. So this whole month, I'm going to stand here in this pulpit. I'm not traveling nowhere on the 
the sun that will be right here. And I'm going to hope to build a framework for us where we can understand how we are to live in light of the pain and the promise, the despair, the hope, the struggles, and the victories that make up the human experience. Why? Because when Jesus comes into the world, he takes on human flesh. He don't come as a spirit. He does not
for, for, for crimes and violations that people with wealth never go to jail for. Somebody holler in the mix. Yes. Group violence within our communities where brother are turned against brother and sister against sister. East Oakland against West Oakland. Hunters Point against Fillmore. The Iron Triangle. South Berkeley against West Berkeley. It is violence within our own communities and it should cause us to lament. Somebody holler in the mix. Like this. 
it is not enough for me to stand before you tonight and condemn riots. It would be more of your responsible and responsible for me to do that without at the same time condemning the contingent and tolerable conditions that exist in our society. These conditions are the things that cause individuals to feel that they have no other alternative than to engage in violent rebellions to get attention. And I must say tonight that a riot is the language of the unheard. Take it, 
no date, no devil. Amen. We'll see that another day. There is the sin around us. That is all a structural evil. There is the sin within us. And Paul says it like this. It will overpower you. Yeah, yeah. You can be angry and sin, not but you can be angry and be sinning. Yeah. When you don't forgive, you're full of sin. Yeah. When you are holding these, 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 these strategy sessions to hurt other people, you are sinning, and you and I must kill off that sin. Somebody 
Somebody say amen. Right? amen. And they'll keep taking your brown dollar and your yellow dollar and your white dollar. They'll take your money even if they can't stand your person. Right. So I'm here to tell you until you start loving people and loving us, then you we gonna keep our money. Yeah. We're gonna put our money in places where people who are building up our communities Thank you. can benefit from our resources. Right. That's what black boycott on Friday was about. I was going to say a word that I can't say. <laughs> you dummy! I can say that one. <laughs> Wall Street Journal. Forbes Magazine. Fortune 500. They all wrote articles about this boycott being planned. You know more than you? <laughs> Evidently they thought it was something for them to take time out to write articles about it. It's the beginning of something. But will we as the people of God participate through the body, the ballot, and the buck? Come on, come on. The Montgomery bus boycott lasted, I think, 380 days. There's been resistance now for over 110, 15 days in Ferguson. We tried to do three days of boycotts. The question for us as we start to see and make these connections, will the church be engaged in this powerful moment of resistance? This is our work. And the final thing, my brothers and sisters, the text tells us, there is hope for your future. Your children will come back home. Our work is not just to lament, it's not just to work, but it is to hope. Somebody have a hope? This is our season. Yeah. 
Yes. This is your season. Yes, Lord. This is the season. 